So here's a good question. How can our economy produce more than our productive capacity? How is that possible? Well, it is possible. Our, co our economy is so complicated in the way that it works with its land, labor, and capital that it is actually possible to produce more than what is possible to produce. And I'm going to explain this uh, giving you a story and a couple of analogies, okay? So think about a gallon container of milk, you know, a, a gallon jug that you might get at the grocery store, okay? Now, I don't know how familiar you are with gallon jugs of milk, but I have a lot of experience with them, okay, because I like milk. Um, so, you know, you, you buy a gallon container, it's kind of clear maybe, or maybe you buy the ones that are, aren't clear, the opaque ones, if you buy Mayfield milk. Uh, but you buy milk at the grocery store, and you know every day you pour a little bit of milk into your cereal, or maybe you, you make a, a glass of chocolate milk or something like that. But eventually, you, uh, you, know, you run out of milk, and the milk container becomes empty, right? All right, and normally you just sort of crush it and throw it away or something like that, or maybe you use it for something else. So here's the question. How much milk can you fit, or how much milk do they fit in a gallon container of milk? Well, the answer obviously is one gallon because that's how they made the, the container a one gallon container. They fill one gallon of milk into the container and then they sell it at the store as one gallon of milk. Okay, so the capacity of the jug is one gallon. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I've done this before. I'm sure I was a bored teenager or maybe in middle school or something. But did you know that you can take a one gallon milk jug and if you clean it out and uh, maybe dry it out, if you take that gallon jug and you put your mouth up to the opening of the, uh, of the gallon container and you blow into it, it'll actually expand the plastic. There's, a, there's these little like indentations in the jug, uh, probably for manufacturing purposes. And what'll happen is when you blow air uh, into the jug, it'll actually force out all of those contours uh, so that the, it blows up almost like a bubble, okay? Uh, not too much, you still got the handle, but if you, after you blow into it, if you set it down, it's got sort of a rounded bottom now, it won't sit flat on a table. When you do that, you're distorting the shape of the jug, it's permanently damaged. The, 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 the jug is permanently misshapen, but it will now fit more than one gallon. At that point, you can now fit in there like 1.1 gallons or maybe even 1.2 gallons. And when you do that, you are increasing the capacity of the jug container. And you are now able to put more in the jug than its capacity. You have increased the capacity of the jug, but you have permanently damaged the jug by doing that. I hope, I hope with that analogy, you're, you can see where I'm going with the idea of the economy producing more than the productive capacity. Now I'm going to tell you a story. It's an old fable. It's the story about uh, the man with the, uh, the goose. Well, it's, it's, just, it's called the story about the goose that lays the golden egg. And here's how the story goes is that uh, there was a farmer, uh, you know, this is back in probably, I don't know, ancient times, or maybe it was in like the 1700s or the 1600s. There was a farmer who had a goose. And one day, and, and the goose would lay an egg every day, like, like many, you know, um, birds do, like chickens and that sort of thing. And so one day he went out and to get an egg from his goose, and instead of having a regular egg, the goose actually had laid an egg of pure gold. And so he was amazed, and, and so he obviously was excited, and he took this golden egg, and he you know, brought it into town, and sure enough, they found that it is pure gold, and someone bought it from him, and he got a good amount of money for this egg. Um, 
And so he was able to buy things that he wasn't able to buy before. Well, the next day he went back out to get another egg from the goose and there was another golden egg. And he was really excited now because this is two days in a row that he gets a golden egg. From every day after that, every time he went out to get an egg from the goose, that at once per day, that goose would lay a golden egg. And this man obviously over not very much time became kind of wealthy. But also after time, he started to become very greedy. He started to become impatient with the goose. The goose would only give him one golden egg per day. And now that just wasn't enough for him. He had plans for all this money that he could get. And he had plans for the gold. And he became a very wealthy and well-known person. And there were things he wanted to accomplish. And that, e that goose was not laying eggs fast enough. So here's what he thought. He thought that the goose was holding back on him, that the goose was full of lots of golden eggs, and that if he took the goose and if he cuts the goose open, he could get all of the golden eggs at once. Now, obviously, that's dumb uh, because, you know, it, the goose isn't doesn't have a stock of golden eggs inside of him. If you understand how, how you know, chickens work and that sort of thing, there's no stock of eggs inside of them. Obviously, they produce them once per day as they go. Their body just produces the egg, and then they lay the egg. But this impatient uh, farmer went and took the golden goose, decided he was going to cut the golden goose open and get all of the golden eggs at once. And then he cut the golden goose open, he opened up the goose, and there were no golden eggs inside obviously. But now what happened? Obviously, he killed the golden goose that was producing the eggs for him. Now, you probably heard this story before or a version of it, uh, but obviously now the next day the guy did not get any more golden eggs for the rest of his life. No more golden eggs. Why? Because he killed the goose that lays the golden egg. Now, the, one of the morals of that story is the idea that you don't want to damage whatever it is that is providing you with some kind of benefit. For example, if you own a company and your company gives you profit, but if you become impatient with the profit that you're earning, if you're not happy with what profit you are earning, even though it might be a lot of profit, you might do something to hurry up everybody. You might yell at your employees and say, you're not working fast enough. I want more profit, more profit, more profit. And then you wind up hurting your employees and your employees leave. And now you've lost all of your factors of production that have been producing all of that profit for you. And you have killed the goose that lays the golden egg. And so the idea here is you want to be patient and get one golden egg per day. And it's the same thing with our economy. What we do sometimes is we overuse our resources. We overuse our factors of production. And when we use them more than we should in a period of time so that we can get more output, we're essentially producing more than our productive capacity. We are killing the goose that lays the golden egg for us by blowing into the milk carton, expanding it so that it can produce more, so that it has a higher capacity, but that higher capacity is only temporary. It can't last forever. And so I'm going to give you a few notes here that are related to this idea of how can we produce more than our productive capacity. Okay, well, productive capacity assumes a few things. The first thing that it, it assumes is that unemployment, or is that we have, in, our unemployment rate is at the natural rate of unemployment. Meaning this, productive capacity does not assume that all of our labor resources are being used. It assumes that there is already some structural unemployment and some frictional unemployment, right? Isn't that what uh, the natural rate of unemployment is, right? We said that the natural rate of unemployment is the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment and that that is the same thing as full employment, 
All right, so the, so the natural rate of unemployment is the rate of unemployment that gives us full employment in the economy. But we already learned several lessons ago that full employment doesn't mean that every single person is employed. It doesn't even mean that every single uh, uh, person in the labor force is employed. It means that the level of unemployment is where we have some unemployment due to frictional unemployment and structural unemployment. There's unemployment to where people can move from one job to the next, and we need that. We need that flexibility because we need our labor resources to be able to move from where they're less effective to where they're more effective. Also, structural unemployment. We have jobs available for people who aren't ready for those jobs. And then, th so those people aren't working, they're not in those jobs, they're off getting the skills that they need so that they can then move into those jobs. So we have some unemployment, okay? So we have some frictional and structural unemployment. And so what I'm saying is that productive capacity is already accounting for the fact that some of our labor resources are not being used at any moment because they're either moving from job to job or they're getting the skills they need for the next job that they're going to be in. Okay. All right. Second, productive capacity assumes the use the use of factors that allows downtime and maintenance. Here's what I mean. Our land, labor, and capital, productive capacity assumes that there are times when the land, labor, and capital are not being used. Land that is used for crops needs to recover sometimes. It needs to recover its nutrients. And so if we overuse our natural resources, like the goose that lays the golden egg, that is a natural resource, that goose. You can't overuse the goose. If you overuse the goose, it will stop producing golden eggs or it will produce golden eggs that aren't as good or aren't as large. You might get more of them, but eventually they'll deteriorate in quality, okay? So you have to give your land downtime. It has to be able to rest so that it is strong. Same thing with labor. Labor, you know, typically our labor, well, our work week is about 40 hours a week. And so, could your labor work 80 hours a week? Can you make your labor work 80 hours a week? Yes, you can threaten your workers and say, well, you have to work more. If you don't come in tomorrow, I'm gonna fire you. So now you're threatening your workers and you're not giving them downtime to spend with their family. You're not giving them downtime to remember why it is that they work in the first place. They don't work to work, they work to get money so that they can go spend that money to consume and have utility, have satisfaction. If you don't give them time to go spend their money, they're gonna start asking why are they making money in the first place? And so you have to give your labor downtime and your capital needs to be maintained. You have to shut off the machines so that you can do an oil change on the engine of that machine. You can't use that lawnmower perpetually all the time for 168 hours a week. That capital needs downtime and maintenance. Productive capacity accounts for the downtime and the maintenance of, your, of the factors of production. So, uh, there's, that sets the limit on what can actually be produced, the possible production in the economy, okay? Let's see here. And so here's the idea. This, if we overuse our factors of production, that's where, that's where the idea of killing the goose that lays the golden egg comes in. You could wind up killing your land, killing your labor, 
and destroying your capital because you're overusing it to overproduce, to produce more than the productive capacity in the economy. The third thing that is, uh, that is assumed in productive capacity is that our factors of production, that we have long-term and permanent access to them. And here's what I mean by that. You, let's say that you deliver things. Your company delivers, um, I don't know, uh, auto parts, okay? And your company only has four trucks for delivering auto parts. But business is really good, and you need more than four trucks, okay? So, but instead of buying another truck to increase your productive capacity by increasing your, your stock of capital. Instead, you ask your employee, one of your employees, somebody who's not normally a driver, to make deliveries in their own personal car. So you say to the, to the guy who's working at the counter, hey, you're not doing anything right now. Can you drive in your car and take these auto parts over to these uh, um, you know, garages, uh, automotive garages, and deliver these auto parts? Well, that may be fine uh, for you know, once or twice a week or something like that, but you're, you don't have permanent access to that person and their vehicle. Productive capacity assumes that you're not using the personal vehicles of your employees. Productive capacity assumes that you're not using your desk workers to be delivery workers, okay? And so productive capacity assumes that all of your capital that you're using for certain jobs, that you have that for the long term and for permanent production. But when you start shuffling your resources to do things that they're not made to do, or borrowing resources that don't belong to you, then you're overproducing. You're making more than you're actually capable of producing. And so here's what we're saying. If an economy violates one or more of these assumptions, real GDP will exceed possible real GDP. And this is what we mean when we say that sometimes the business cycle is higher than natural real GDP. Actual output is higher than possible output. Actual production is higher than productive capacity. Okay? And now that we understand the idea that we can, in an economy, actually produce more than, than, than our productive capacity, we can now understand output gaps as we look at the business cycle relative to natural real GDP.